Hello. We're going to get started. Um, there will be time for questions at the end. And yep, this is Todd Weaver. And he'll be presenting the future of computing and why you should care. Thank you. Um, I'll just dive straight in. Uh, I want to get started with a uh, little about me. Uh, so I'm going to share with you six statements, and you get to decide which ones are true and which ones are false. Uh, and I'll answer them at the end of this talk. The first one for you to think about is I was born in the U.S. Capitol, Washington, D.C., on Independence Day in 1974, making my birthday 7474. Number two, I've been a digital rights activist since 1995. Number three, I played bass guitar for a decade in a punk rock band I joined in 2003. Number four, I built, wrote, and deployed over a quarter million GNU-based hardware media players in 2005. Number five, I started the first online cable company in 2007 and was sued for $30 billion by 34 big media companies for copyright infringement. Number six, I wrote and directed a play about the double entendre of the word booty in a pirate and mermaid musical called Pirate Booty in 2017. I'll let you think about those, and then I'll answer them at the end of this talk. Now, let me set the tone by providing a great quote from a great person in history. The ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty by the bad people, but the silence over that by the good people. Martin Luther King Jr. In this talk, I would like to discuss the future of computing and why you should care. Let me start by saying, I believe we can change the future of computing for the better. However, currently, something is wrong with our digital world. It's something basic, something's rotten at the core. I want to talk to you about what that is, how it came to be, and why we must change it. And I want you to care because a person who won't care has no advantage over one who doesn't care, by Mark Twain. This talk comes in three parts. Part one, the history of the mistreatment of our digital rights. Most big tech companies that abuse people are based in the US. Therefore, I will describe the history from that perspective. Some things you need to understand. Governments write the rules of the game that society plays. There are always rules, and right now, governments influenced by big tech are writing those rules. If you are somebody who wants no rules whatsoever, you will quickly realize rules will be written that govern you without your involvement. My sage advice to you is write the rules. Let's write the rules that we want to see in an ethical society that respects freedoms and liberties. You may know that exploitative big tech abuse our digital rights because it's at the core of their business. It's the root problem. It will not get better unless any one of three things happen. First, government regulation. That's ethical for society. Business models change to something ethical for society. Or people switch to something ethical for society. Big tech, which is corporations whose business models exploit humanity for profit, they all suffer from a systemic toxin that discourages personal freedoms and removes any digital rights we as society demand. Big tech corporations are already starting the marketing to try to differentiate themselves from it. But marketing alone will not remove the poison 
within their business model. As a minor disclaimer, you may ask, but you're a company. Actually, we're a social purpose corporation. And that's not just a series of buzzwords. It's a legal framework of a business that carries with it significant importance. It's the reason we can't ever exploit people for profit. It's the reason we are unlike at all big tech who are formed to strip your digital rights in the name of maximizing shareholder value. There was a recent article in Inc. Magazine about us. Purism is what is called a social purpose corporation, which allows a business to prioritize social objectives over fiduciary duties. Let me dive deeper into the problem. All corporations, including all big tech giants, have a single goal. It's maximize shareholder value. That's it, and that is the only goal. But it's not just a goal. Under eBay versus Newman, a lawsuit setting legal precedent, stating the law makes it literally malfeasance for a corporation not to do everything it legally can to maximize its profits. So if given a choice of making a dollar by exploiting people online or opting to treat people ethically, the corporation must exploit people online for the dollar. Or the board of directors and the executives could face a lawsuit from any shareholder that claims they did not maximize the value of their shares. The regulation at the foundation of big tech are forcing the exploitation of our digital rights. Quoting Chancellor William B. Chandler III, who sums up the problem perfectly in his Delaware court opinion when eBay sued Craigslist for not maximizing its shares because it was a shareholder. Having chosen a for-profit corporate form, as Craigslist did, the directors are bound by the fiduciary duties to promote the value of the corporation for the benefit of its stockholders. We have centuries of legal precedent in the physical world, advanced by science and society, guiding our moral compass, trespassing laws, freedom of speech, privacy rights, protection against personal harm and abuse. We have nearly no digital rights. Big tech trespasses on your data, restricts speech, obliterates privacy entirely. Big tech exploits people, causes harm, and inflicts abuse upon our society. If somebody approached your bedroom window from outside, put a camera up, and started recording, you would immediately call the authorities, report the numerous laws broken, a case would be opened, an arrest could be made. Charges could be pressed, trials could ensue, criminals could go to jail. But in the digital world, none of that exists. You are forced to leak far more details than a camera in your bedroom would share, and you are forced to leak them and that personal data from your phone all the time. This is like a wake of a ship and being scooped up by big tech and any groups that have influence over them. Big tech exploits you every millisecond of every day. All future government regulation will be influenced, funded, and lobbied by big tech. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine a future regulation where big tech wins to cryptographically sign everything with their keys under their control on their products. What a nightmare scenario. Could you imagine your mobile phone under the complete control of Apple or Google? I hope you can recognize the sarcasm. We need to write the rules based on values we want in society. AI algorithms from Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, IBM, and Apple, humorously and accurately shortened to G-Mafia, have one input variable. 
maximize shareholder value. That translates directly into gather everything on all of society, keep people digitally captive, maximize exposure time, and polarize opinion to elicit more profit. That's not what AI should be taught. Due to data manipulation, no two people in society are getting the same information. It's impossible to have a sane debate about any polarizing topic because we aren't starting with the foundation of shared knowledge. What if the input request to AI algorithms was respect people? What would society look like then? A quick poll. Who would like an unethical society? Or who would like an ethical society. All right, good, I just do some quick calculation here. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Maximizing shareholder value in a society that has nearly no digital rights guarantees exploitation of that society. Why did we let this happen? How did we let this happen? I know why. because it's convenient to give up control. It's convenient for you to download a proprietary application that exploits you, agree to the legally binding terms of service that you, know you didn't read, and blissfully believe big tech is helping you in the digital world. It's inconvenient to stand up for your freedom. It seems that we're offered to choose between convenience and control, or inconvenience and freedom. I believe we can have both convenience and freedom. We can build technology that benefits society faster when they are based on principles we deem ethical. Society's technology genius is not lacking. Its moral genius is. Society's trust in big tech is eroding rapidly. No big tech company has core values that help our digital rights. The largest challenge we will face is the marketing budgets of big tech when they claim things like we protect your privacy. Actually, you exploit personal private data without a person's knowledge, or we use encryption by big tech. Actually, it's inside proprietary apps that you control, or we are secure. Actually, you hold the master keys controlling society. Or my favorite, you can trust us. Actually, you won't let anybody verify anything. Part two, the present. Currently, big tech is maximizing shareholder value without values. The products, software, and services offered by big tech will continue to mistreat people unless we can establish what digital rights are and change society for the better. Then. We can advocate, regulate, and build products that adhere to those digital rights. Here's another great quote. It is curious that physical courage should be so common in the world and moral courage so rare. By Mark Twain. I believe there are five fundamental digital rights. The first is the right to change providers. If a person wants to change a service provider, they can easily move to another, That's decentralized services. Two is the right to protect personal data. A person owns and controls their own master keys to encrypt and all data and communication, and nobody else. That's user-controlled encryption. The right to verify. Society has the freedom to inspect the source of all software used, and can run it as they wish for any purpose simple software freedom. The right to be forgotten. A service provider only stores the minimal personal data necessary to provide the service. Once the data is no longer required, it's deleted. That's minimal data retention. 
the right to access. A person must not be discriminated against nor forced to agree to any terms and conditions before accessing the service. And that's just simple personal liberty. If we can do those things, then we can change the future of computing for the better. Part three, the future. As technology gets closer and closer to the brain, our moral issues of digital rights become clearer and clearer. It started with computers, where we could leave them and then come back with them. And then it moved on to phones that we have, always have on or near us with millisecond leakage of personal data beyond human comprehension. But those are just the beginning of the tsunami wave growing. Wearables we already have that are tracking very private details. IoT devices are literally everywhere. And I have to stop and remind everybody that the S in IoT is for security. And finally, we have surgically implanted which are you know, brain embeddables that can read and write electrical signals in your brain. A question to consider, what big tech company would you purchase your future brain implant from? This is coming. A quick poll, who would like a big tech controlled brain or control your own brain? Oh, good. Knowing the severity of your technology decisions and your understanding of the importance of ethical technology, it is a wonder why unethical big tech is still big. Let's all advocate, regulate, and release products, software, and services that ensure digital rights, that are convenient and ethical for society. If we do that, we can advance technology that is rooted in ethical values. And rather than fear what may be coming from big tech, we can welcome our own advancements with open arms and open minds from our ethical, socially responsible technology organizations. I believe we can change the future of computing for the better. Oh, and to answer the six statements from the beginning about me as either true or false, Number one, I was born in the US Capitol, Washington, DC on Independence Day in 1974, making my birthday 7474. I was born a patriot, it is true. Number two, I have been a digital rights activist since 1995, that's a pretty easy one, it's true. I played bass guitar for a decade in a punk rock band I joined in 2003. I would be impressed if you've heard of it, but it happens to be true. I built, wrote, and deployed over a quarter million GNU-based hardware media players in 2005. It's a fun lesson in hardware supply chain and liberated software development, but it also happens to be true. Number five, I started the first online cable company in 2007 and was sued for $30 billion by 34 big media companies for copyright infringement. That's a pretty fun story, uh, and it's also true. I wrote and directed a play about a double entendre, the word booty, in a Pirate and Mermaid musical called Pirate Booty in 2017. It's released under Creative Commons license, and it's also true. <laughs> Before I turn it over to questions from you, uh, I have a few questions for you. Will you buy big tech products that lock you in with their keys so you have no control? Will you use big tech products to control and exploit you for profit? Will you use big tech services that control you and exploit you and your friends? Will you use products and services from big tech when you know they are rotten to the core? I suggest you take a chapter from history and answer those oppressing choices with nope, like Rosa Parks did. And to quote the great Richard Stallman from yesterday, friends don't let friends get spied on. Unethical or ethical, 
what future will you choose? Now, I can't leave here without giving a quote from a punk rock band. What's your plan for tomorrow? Are you a leader or will you follow? Are you a fighter or will you cower? It's our time to take back the power. That's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Weaver. Hello. Uh, you take a pretty high-minded approach, except for the booty part. Um, one of my concerns about purism is the high prices of the products. Sure. Uh, to have the m more impact on society, I think it would be really beneficial to make your offerings more available to the masses. Mm -hmm. um, I would challenge you to make a notebook uh, that is more affordable, perhaps in the range of $300, maybe based on an ARM chip, mm -hmm. uh, and, and market it to a larger segment of the population? Does that sound like a, a reasonable request? Very much so. Um, so actually one of the important pieces of making change is gaining leverage, and gaining leverage allows us to actually influence the supply chain. So a lot of that is economies of scale. So as we start to purchase more, our costs start to reduce. So it's not just necessarily CPU choice, it's also gaining leverage in the supply chain. So we are actually advancing free software and movement into the supply chain, which has never been done before. We're having conversations about liberating uh, firmware that has never been discussed. So uh, our phone, the Libra 5 phone, is an ARM-based uh, CPU. Mm -hmm. And the price point for that is under price point for all flagship uh, phones today. So we already we recognize that this is a future that we want to have. Part of it is economies of scale. The other aspect is being able to have uh, an ARM-based CPU that's also completely liberated. Mm -hmm. So ARM-based laptops is certainly on the roadmap for us. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Thank you very much.